Um, hi, Raymond. Hi, Sasha. All right, so I'm gonna start by doing my screen, but before I do, just remember to use the chat box to um, answer questions and um, let's see, what was the other thing? Oh, the Google form, the exit survey will be on the website as usual for you guys to fill out after class. And then uh, also if you need it, it'll be at the end of this video, which will be also up on the website as soon as it's processed, okay? All right, so let's see. I'm getting a few extra people coming in, so I'm glad we waited. Um, but we are going to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Okay, and I'm going to pull up my chats. Okay. So the first screen is just the name of the artist that we're going to be looking at today. His name is Albert Dürer. He is a German Renaissance painter, and he's one of my favorites from Germany. I hope you will also like him. But before we get started, I want you guys to do me a favor and close your eyes. Now, we're going to do a little activity. We're going to pretend we're Albert Dürer here, but I want you to close your eyes and listen to a description of an animal. I'm gonna read it to you. And then if you think you know what it is, when I tell you I'm done, I want you to write your guess in the chat box of what do you think I am describing, okay? So here we go, I'm gonna read it to you right now. So close your eyes and inside of your head, Imagine what it is that I'm saying. So almost like draw a picture in your mind, okay? Here it is. Its body is tapered at both ends and streamlined. It has a large head, a short neck, and an elongated body. The tail is short, stiff, and wedged shape. That means like a triangle. The legs are webbed, the legs and webbed feet are set far back on the body, which gives it an upright posture on land. So there's a couple of clues. It lives in the water and on land. It has webbed feet, a long body that's tapered at both ends, what do you think it is? I'm done with my description. If you can type it in the chat box, tell me what you think I just described to you. Let's see. All right, someone says duck. A lot of people say duck. It's not a duck, not a turtle not a beaver or a frog. Remember it has, a, nope, not a dino. It has a long body. It, I'll give you another hint. It's black and white and it waddles. Not a platypus, good guess. Not a goose. A penguin, good job. So excellent, everyone guessing penguin now. Very good. So if you got it into the chat box, excellent. It is a penguin. So why am I doing this exercise? Well, I'll get to that in our lesson. So you're gonna have to wait and hear about that, okay? So let's go on to our next slide. So this is a picture of Albrecht Dewar as a 13 year old. He drew this when he was 13. It's a pretty good drawing, a self portrait at the age of 13. Now, we'll look at this again in a minute, but he is our German Renaissance man. Now, the reason we know so much about Albrecht Dewar is because he kept a journal 
or a diary. Now, I want to encourage you guys to keep a journal or a diary as well if you can, or like Tristan does where he writes books. These are great ways for us to know more about you or further down the line, your children or your grandchildren can learn more about you is through the keeping of a diary. Now he was born May 21st, so this week would have been the celebration of his birthday. In 1471, he was born in Nuremberg, Germany. Now Albrecht was the third child and second son of 18 children. That is a lot of children, okay? But unfortunately, only three of them ever made it to adulthood. So his mother and father knew a lot about tragedy and loss. His father was a goldsmith. That's someone that uses gold to make jewelry. And he was very good at it. And that job is very respected in the time period that he lived in. Now, Dewar did get to attend school. And he became an apprentice to his father. Now, normally the apprenticeship would go to the oldest son, but because his older brother died, that went to Albrecht. So Albrecht got to learn all about goldsmithing and what that meant and how you did it. Okay, let's look at our next slide. Now, Albrecht showed great skill with a burn. Now, a burn is this, these metal tools here. He would have had to use these tools to carve gold, and he, it was really difficult. He had to have a lot of precision and accuracy, and he had to take his time, be very patient, because if he messed up, he had to start all over melting the gold back down. You couldn't erase your mistakes with the gold, okay? Um, but Dewar really wanted to be a painter, and his dad at first didn't think he had what it took to be a painter. And then after he proved himself, his dad said, I'm so sorry for taking up your time as a goldsmith when you really could have just been an artist. So Dewar got to travel to Italy where there was a lower renaissance going on. Now, the German renaissance was different, and I'll show you why in just a second. Here is a, a painting of, of a, from a German Renaissance period. Now, the Germans were very practical and down to earth in their paintings. They were very dark palette, like the colors are much darker and very natural or had a lot of nature scenes in them. But the Renaissance that was going on in Italy was a little different. It was a lighter color scheme. They were more fantasy or um, idealized worlds. Here is a wedding betrothal, and you can also see the architecture of Italy in the background. Um, they were very proud of their domed um, top of their buildings. They came up with that whole idea, and the arches and the columns. So the Italian Renaissance was very interested in Greek and Roman ancient art. Going back to those things, you see a lot of perspective here. The vanishing point is right through this doorway on this um, architectural structure in the background. You can see all the lines pointing to it. The people are getting smaller, so proportion is there. Um, all the poses of people look very natural and realistic. So a little different than the German Renaissance. And so Albrecht went to Italy to learn about these new styles and take them back with him to Germany and apply them. So he got married to Agnes Frey and became very successful. He did work for emperors and dukes that were patrons or they paid him. That's how he was able to become wealthy is they paid him to do artwork for them. This was his house, it's now a museum in Germany. Now, this was considered a, a very large house for this time period, um, and I think it's really typical Bavarian um, style of Germany. It's very cute. Now, he died in, at the age of 57, that's pretty young, um, from a high fever. He went hiking to get to a scene that he wanted to draw. He loved a sketch from nature, and he actually had to hike through a swamp, and when he did, he must have contracted a virus or bacteria and got a fever and ended up passing away. So I'm gonna ask you a question. You can put it in the chat box if you don't mind. What does Renaissance mean? If you, good, okay, I'm getting some answers right away. I'll wait for a few more people. Good, yes, yes.
Yes, you guys are getting it. It means new birth or rebirth. Mm hmm. Good. Yes. So what was being reborn was the the classic understanding of perspective and proportion from the Greek and Romans. Now we moved from that period of time into what's called iconic art or medieval art, where they didn't want to look like what they considered pagans, which were the Greeks and Romans. So they made everything look very flat. Well, then the Renaissance was a new understanding of, of humanitarianism and learning about an ideal world and proportion and making people look very realistic. Science discoveries were taking place. People weren't at war from the medieval times, so they had time to study art. And so they started using those skills of old to make their art look very realistic. Do you guys know when it occurred? What period of time do you think the Renaissance occurred? Good, yep, getting some answers. Yep, between the 14th and 16th century. So you guys are pretty close, yes. Does anyone know what a Renaissance man is? In Italy, we would have said Leonardo da Vinci was a Renaissance man. So what is a Renaissance man? Let me give you guys some time. You guys are answering really well. Thank you. You guys are getting this information, which shows you've done really good in your history classes. Okay, it's not a dressed up ma'am, not a person who took, well, let me see. I can't see what the rest of that says. Let me see. Um, okay, no, not someone that, explain a little bit more when you say took part in the Renaissance, a fancy dude, no. <laughs> so if you guys were Renaissance people, I'm gonna, not famous, no. Nope. I'm gonna give you another second to try to make some guesses how to roll, no. Nope. They stopped using armor, no, nope. revolutionized, no. Nope. Oh, good. Okay, Curtin family. Yes. A man who is well educated in many different areas. Good. So a Renaissance man is someone that loves science and math. They love art and history. They knew a little bit about everything. Jack of all trades. Excellent. Yes. They knew a lot about everything. So that's a Renaissance man. Now, the German Renaissance was a little different than the Italian Renaissance, other than the color schemes, but it was also different because of the printing. They did wood prints, mono prints, um, metal prints. And how do you think Dewar's past helped him with being a printer? What did he learn in his past that it would have helped him be a really good artist using printmaking? goldsmithing. Yes, you guys are getting it. Good job. Remember those burns he had to use? He would have been really good at carving into metal or wood to make prints. And so that past really helped him in his art field as well. Now, can anyone tell me what invention another German by the name of Johann Gutenberg aided in this German Renaissance art of printmaking? Does anyone know an invention by Johann Gutenberg? He was also a German and also a goldsmith at one point, Mr. Gutenberg. Does anyone know what he invented? Oh, I'm getting some answers. Yes, very good. Yes, the printing press. Good, yes, you guys are all getting this. All right, so the printing press was where you could make an image over and over again using a carved or a print or type. Okay, so this gave Germany the idea of using that in the art form. So Gutenberg took several trips to Italy and was inspired by their use of perspective and proportion. He even taught little kids how to draw. He never had children of his own, unfortunately, but he did enjoy teaching. He also used the cross hatch, which I'll show you in a second. And he always was sketching, always, always sketching and painting from nature, not just from memory like many artists did at the time. He liked to paint from life. So here is again that self-portrait. If I zoom in really close, 
right down here is an example of cross hatch. That's using lines going in two opposite directions and over here, the closer you put them together and the more you put, the darker the value. And so he used cross hatch in a lot of his paintings or sketches. Now, the next picture I'm gonna show you, this is a picture of his mother and father. Now, Albrecht Dewar thought that the eyes and the hands were the windows to the soul. He thought that's how you knew a person. Yes, he did make it look very realistic, okay? Now, in the hands of both his mother and father are rosary beads. That was something they used as part of their religion. Also, they're very similar, even though they're painted two years apart, the headdress on her that covers her hair, that was a sign that she was married. It makes a V on her chest. And on his dad, the fur makes a V on his chest. And all the little creases in the fabric on his mother, which her name was Barbara, make little triangles. And the same thing on his father, Albrecht the senior, make triangles. Now, he loved both of his parents very, very much, and he, they were a very happy family, despite all the, the tragedy that they had. Um, they look very serious in the painting, but that's okay. He wanted to show them realistically and aged. Um, so he shows his dad at this picture, I think it's like 63, and his mother is only 39. She was 15 years old when she married him and he was 40. That seems a little ooey to us right now, but in that period of time, that was, that was pretty normal for a very young woman to marry an older man, okay? Um, yeah, it is different. Okay, so these two paintings were his first oil paintings, and like I said, he painted them two more times, but he just wanted to show them um, as they were very realistic. He does get better as he paints but I will show you the next one. Now this one is called The View of Arco. I'm gonna let you guys look at this for a second. And this is a town, oh goodness, yeah, you guys are seeing stuff already. This is a town that he would have seen on the way to Italy, okay? And at the bottom of this little mountain, now this isn't the exact interpretation, it's not an exact representation, I mean, of the city. He did change a few things. But at the bottom is a walled-in city named Arco, and if you wind up the side of the mountain, you see the castle, okay? It's very beautiful. Down here is an olive grove, okay? But can you find something on the mountain that's a little trick that he stuck in there? It's kind of funny. Look and see if you can find it. Mm-hmm, yeah, good job, Conros. Yep, good job, Lewis. Family, you got it. Grayson got it, yep, yes, Anastasia, good. Give a couple more people a chance to see if they can find it in the side of the mountain. Right here. Good, Libby and Emily. You guys see anything right here where my cursor's moving? Yes, Ryan. Yes, good curtains. It's a crabby old man's profile from the side. See his nose, big old nose, grumpy little frowny face, squinty eyes. Yep, grumpy old man. <laughs> so I think that's pretty funny. Okay. And the next picture I'm gonna show you, now this was a self-portrait Albrecht did when he was 29. He got a lot of criticism for this one because the people at the time thought he was trying to look too much like Jesus. I don't really know what his intention was, but um, I still think he did a beautiful job with the colors. And um, I don't know why he drew the face. I tried to find out, but no one knew why he drew the face on the view of Arco. So I'm going back to that picture. But anyway, he did get um, some pushback on this particular self-portrait, even though I think he did a lovely job making it look very realistic. This is a watercolor and gouache um, print of a little hare or young hare, which is a rabbit. Now this one is beautiful because it looks like you can feel the fur. So this would be, texture that you can see and imagine but you can't actually touch right now this is a great example of patience because mr dewar would had to have sketched the bunny 
Then he would have colored it in with an undercoat of a watercolor wash and then taken his paintbrush and gone in and done each of those little strokes for the fur. That would have taken a really long time, but he made it look very realistic. At the bottom, which we'll see in some other ones, is his signature and the date. It's an A and a D. He always does a big A and a little D inside. Now, doer is means it the root of it is tour which means door okay so he made it almost look like a door his his um initials okay did he use any tools yes he used many tools when he was doing his printing and carving um and we'll talk about that in a little bit now the next painting i'm going to show you is called um the great piece of turf okay now i want you to look at this he did such a good job painting nature he was one of the most realistic nature painters of his time period and could you imagine him laying right there on the ground rolling over and seeing this little tuft of grass and thinking i'm gonna draw and paint it it's right at eye level if he was laying on the ground and he did such a good job you can't see that why it's off center okay my daughter's helping me out so let me see off center meaning if i move the chat box is that better hayden like this okay show me what you mean hayden I'm sorry, technical difficulties over here. <laughs> technical difficulties. All right, what is up? What do you see? Oh, I think it's because you're on the phone. I don't think it would be like that on the computer. I think other people say it's fine. Yeah, I think yeah. it's just you, Hayden. <laughs> sorry. Okay, let's okay, go let's back go to the um, great piece great. of turf. All right, so. If you look at this picture really closely, do you guys see a particular flower that maybe mom and dad can't stand being in their yard and they like to pick them and get them out? Go ahead, Afton. Say it one more time, sweetie. Did you say dandelion? Okay, hold on. I can't get you unmuted. It won't unmute for me. So can you type it into the chat box, Afton? Do you know how to do that? Yes. Oh, there you are. You're unmuted now. Go ahead and tell me. What uh, was it? A dandelion. Very good, honey. Yes, dandelion, which are kind of weed. But he did such a good job painting this realistically that you can tell what these things are. Um, I'm thinking the other thing, I'm not really sure if it's... Um, watercress or buttercup some of these little little leaves over here might be that and then there's grass growing in between and the grass seeds up top but it's very realistic he did a great job painting this one okay now this one a lot of you might know or have seen this one this one's called the praying hands or the apostle hands now this was actually a preliminary sketch of a larger piece he did where he um, included more of the figure, but unfortunately that got burned down um, and lost. So all we have of that is this sketch of praying hands, which a lot of artists have used and imitated throughout history. I like this one a lot. Very realistic hands. You can tell Dewar loved hands. This one is called The Little Owl. There's actually some YouTube videos on the history of this one. It's very cute. I like this one a lot. Again, it shows Dewar's love of detail, as you can almost see the texture of the feathers. And he takes so much time doing his work. He takes as much time doing a portrait of this little owl as he would a person. So he, threw, he really did love nature and um, expressing those details, okay? All right, so that little owl might have been the, the adult size the owl would have gotten. I'm not 100% sure. This picture is so cool, it's beautiful. I would love to see this in real life, but it's called the wing of a roller. 
A roller is a bird that lives in Southern and Central Europe. And he painted the underside of this wing, probably the actual size of the wing, okay? Um, and you can see all the details of the different feathers, the brown tufts that are cl clustered together seem so soft and the little feathers up by his body seem really soft. And then the flight feathers, you can tell are much coarser and um, thicker, okay? Very cool, very cool indeed. And you'll see this design come up again in a um, picture I'm about to show you. But look at the bottom, you see his AD there? There's his Albrecht Dewar again that he makes look like a door. Why did he love nature so much? I'm not sure if it was just because it was the way he was. Um, he was always outside exploring and taking walks and drawing the things. He was always inspired by everything he saw. Renaissance men love science. And so he probably just loved to see all of nature and how it worked. And he could study it and draw it and understand it better. Okay, the next picture has got a lot of information in it. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about this one. This is basically Albrecht Dewar's psychological self-portrait. In other words, you can see inside of his heart by looking at this, what he loved. And I'm gonna explain, it's gonna take me a minute because there's a lot there, okay? The first thing I wanna talk to you about is this angel that you see sitting here. We would say this is the personification of melancholia. Now, melancholia is the title. You can see it here, the title of this print. And melancholy means sadness, okay? Now, she or he, we don't really know. We think it's a she because most of the time melancholy is known as to be a woman. Melancholy here is an angel with wings, much like the wings we just saw of the roller. Okay, so he used his understanding of when he did this one to make the wings of this angel. Now, there is another little angel sitting right here. That would have been known as a puto. It's kind of like a little cherub with wings, okay? So let's go back to Melancholia here. She has on her head watercress and buttercup, which were two herbs they would have used for melancholy back then, okay? In her hand is a compass, which would have been used for geometry and mathematics. Um, it's also a symbol of, let me find it on my notes. Uh, oh, of creation or um, rational thinking. So that kind of gives a little idea about him. On her waist are some keys right here where my little cursor is moving. The keys show power. All right, um, there's a little money bag right here. It's hard to see because it looks like her dress. But scattered on the ground, there's a tool that was used for melancholy over here on the ground, a medicine tool. Um, there's nails and a straight edge and a saw and a mold. These things uh, and a plane, these were all used in woodworking, which was one of his hobbies, okay? Um, here is a dog, it's a greyhound. You can see its ribs, it looks really hungry. That A dog in a painting or a sketch like this, this is actually a wood print, would have been known for fidelity, okay? Um, there's more woodworking tools here with a hammer. There's a crucible back here which alchemists would use to melt different metals when they would try to make gold. They didn't know back then that gold was a pure element. They thought they could make gold, um, but he would have understood that at being a goldsmith. Okay. This right here is a geometry figure called an octahedron, and there's another one, a sphere, two geometrical figures. These two things showed his skill in perspective. Okay. Now I'm gonna show you some other stuff about him and this artwork. Up here on this wall is a uh, sand or an hourglass. That would have, that's a symbol of time, a shortened amount of time or limited time. Now, this painting was done in 1514. His mother had passed away. So maybe he was feeling melancholy over her loss. Because here's a bell that would have symboled um, life is gone or death has occurred. It would have been a, a bell of 
to alert that. There's a scale here that from history past would have been used as judgment, a symbol of judgment to weigh your soul. Um, no, there's not a lot of color in this. I do agree. Now, right here, I want you, I'm going to try to enlarge it right here. This is called a magic square. This is really cool. So all these, there are numbers that are carved in the square. If you were to go down the column, they would have equal the same number if you go across horizontally or if you go in each quadrant. All right, so all the numbers always add up to be the same. And that number was 34, which was how old he was when his mother died. And at the bottom is 1514, which is when he did the painting, okay? Over here, this is the last little part I'm gonna share with you about him. This is a rainbow, which was a symbol of protection. And there is also a comet or a falling star in the sky. That would have been a symbol of um, bad things or unsure or something not good. Um, but there was a comet that actually fell from the sky in, I think it was 1492, a meteor fell about 30 miles from his home. So he probably was putting that into his history when he, when he did this print. Um, so he would have witnessed that or understood how scary that would have been. Then this is a bat that's holding the sign Melancholia 1. The bat is also a sign of um, bad things. So maybe he's thinking about his mom's death or maybe he's thinking about the struggles of being an artist. I'm not really sure. Grayson, stop doing those symbols, please. Now, Melancholia 1, a philosopher named Agrippa, said there was three stages of melancholy and melancholia one is meant for the imagination or artist in particular. So he entitled it melancholia one for that reason. So there's a lot in this painting. That's why I love Renaissance painting so much um, because it, it allows you to get a, a deeper understanding of the artist. They hide so much meaning in their paintings, symbols and meaning. And I love that about Renaissance art. So this has a lot in it, but it's just the, a peek inside is as if we were reading the diary of Mr. Dewar, okay? So remember when I told you guys to close your eyes and imagine the animal I was reading you? Well, that's what Mr. Dewar did when he made this rhinoceros. He had never seen a rhinoceros because rhinoceros didn't live in Germany. But a man that had seen one described it to Mr. Dewar and based on that description, he made this drawing. And he did a really good job because it looks a lot like a rhinoceros, okay? He added lots of texture and details that aren't usually in a rhinoceros, but he still, I mean, for, from just a description, he did a really good job of making it look like a rhinoceros. Okay, so kudos to Mr. Dewar. Now, like I said, Mr. Dewar, why does it have armor? Why does that rhinoceros have armor? Because I'm sure the man described it almost like it had armor on, like a battle. Well, yeah, I don't know, but I think it's kind of cool. When I said Mr. Dewar was a Renaissance man, he did a lot of things, including writing geometry books. And he also came up with this machine. It was called a perspective machine. It would take a object and he could trace it with this machine and make an exact perspective representation of that object. So it's almost like a copy machine um, of real life things. So that was pretty cool. He invented this perspective machine, okay. This is a self-portrait, another one of Mr. Dewar at the age of 26. And I just showed you this one so you could see how much he has grown in his ability to create the drapery of fabric look more realistic than when he first did his mom and dad and they were all just triangles. Here he's doing lots of folds and creases and he has really taken time to do the texture in his hair as well as the background and the landscape outside of his window. So he is really getting good at his skills. So what is he doing? He's just sitting there posing for his, his, um, his self-portrait. So I'm going to, we're going to end the lesson with that. And I'm going to give you your uh, assignments. So K through six is going to do a mono print if you choose. And I'm going to show you how to do that in just a second. 
7th through 11th, I want you guys to do a detailed observation and try using crosshatch. Now, when I say detailed observation, what I would love for you to do is spend time each day looking at your favorite object. For Mr. Dewar, that was nature. So if you want to do nature, you can, or it could be something inside. But I want you to look at it every day for like 10 minutes and do a sketch of it or write down details of it. And then at the end of like three or four days, I want you to do your final drawing where you use lots and lots of detail. It should take you some time to do this one. Um, the optional K through 11 drawing from description. So for this one, what I, it's gonna need a partner. So you can choose this one instead where you get someone to read you a description of an animal like I did at the beginning and you draw what you hear. You're not allowed to use visuals. So you can't look at a picture of it and draw it. You can only draw what someone reads to you as a description, okay? Now, please continue to send me your artwork. You guys are doing a great job with that, keeping me updated with your um, artwork. And then go out, go to the lcaodyssey.com website and fill out your exit ticket for Germany for art. And then this is the Google form for which I will copy right now and put, if I can, let's see, and put in um, this chat box up here. There we go. So, there's the Google form in the chat box. If you guys want to, and if you don't want to wait for it to show up on the website, which it will be there probably by tomorrow, but you can fill out that Google form for your um, exit survey, okay? So I'm gonna switch to our phone right now, and I'm gonna show the K through six how to do the mono print, if you would like to do this one. So let me go to my phone now. It's gonna take me just a second. Okay, it's starting here. It's working, there we go. Okay, now what I did, what you're gonna to need to do if you're doing a mono print is use a piece of glass or um, a window or some smooth surface like tin foil, um, maybe a bathroom mirror. And you're gonna draw on that surface with washable markers. Please, please, please ask your parents before you do this, okay? But with washable marker, I want you to draw a scene on that smooth surface. Like I said, glass, um, a, um, window, a bathroom mirror, or some tin foil. So on the table here, you can see that I drew with some marker, you can see some colors on my glass tabletop here. Now, all I'm gonna do is take a wet paper towel and a piece of paper. And I'm gonna take my paper towel and I'm gonna rub over my paper. It's not gonna be soaking wet, but I am gonna wet it quite a bit with my paper towel. Then I'm going to lay this wet paper over top of my magic marker and take my hands and try not to move my paper but smooth it out over it i'm going to lift at the corner and when i turn it over you will see my print that i pulled off my glass that's called a mono print okay and this is so much fun to do you guys can do this with your magic marker and whatever you have, whatever scene you wanna paint, you can do that with just a magic marker and a paper towel. So let me stop my screen share. I'm gonna go back to you guys. Okay, let's look at the chats and see. All the other, yes, Mrs. Jackson, Jackson's mom, Mrs. Briggs, yes, all the other lessons have an exit form. Those are in the archive on the website. So if you haven't had a chance to fill out any of the exit surveys, they're all on the archives attached to the lessons. You can find them there. Okay. All right. Okay. 
So are there any questions about the lesson? So K through 11, you guys can do an observation drawing, like um, an auditory description and draw what you hear. Or K through six, you can do this monoprint. And then seven through 11, you guys can do that very detailed repetitive sketch and drawing. So if there are questions, I'm gonna um, just check my chat box before I unmute you guys. Okay. What's the question? Raymond or Sasha, do you guys have a question? 